Welcome back to the Hormone Genius Podcast, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Jamie and I are talking about all things hormones, and we are following up today with um, learning about the cycle, but we want to take it a direction of women basically kind of having an understanding of what's normal mm -hmm. and abnormal about the cycle. So Jamie and I, for years, both of us learning how to chart our cycles, know the importance and value it is not just to understanding our fertility, but to also understanding our health. And as charting teachers, we realize that there are not only major problems with the cycle that people can be aware of, but there are also subtle changes in the cycle that um, women can learn just by starting to chart their cycles. And so what we want to do is just set up a stage of Women understanding that the cycle is a vital sign to their health. And in that, we know like with any vital sign, let's say your blood pressure is a vital sign or your pulse, you have to understand what's normal and what's abnormal so that you can then decide if you should see a healthcare provider about that abnormal. And so just like that for women, we can set up what's normal and abnormal about the cycle and when you should go see a healthcare provider. So Jamie, before we kind of talk about the details of that, do you have any experiences just even as being a charting teacher of having women just kind of have an eye-opening moment of seeing something in their chart that maybe they didn't know was, was abnormal? Yeah, oh, many, many, but I will share one in particular that comes to mind. Um, well, and this, she, this example is not um, the only example where this has come up, but uh, one in particular, um, this gal and her um, fiance were preparing for marriage and she thought that she would, you know, start charting her cycles so that her and her soon to be husband would be able to avoid pregnancy using the system. And their intention was to avoid pregnancy and kind of, you know, see what would happen from there, but avoid pregnancy, understand the cycle, get married, all the things. Okay. So when she started charting, I started noticing, oh, goodness gracious, you're, you're, um, you know, the post ovulatory phase or the number of days after you ovulate until the next period, it's short. It's very short. And you, you have some, um, brown tail and brown bleeding and you have, you know, all these signs that may indicate low progesterone, which may then lead to possible miscarriage. But I, I referred her on to the doctor or to the NAPRO doctor. And then, Sure enough, her progesterone was in fact low. And so she always comes back and says, thank you so much for helping me understand my cycle. She didn't know she had a progesterone issue and to be you know, married and then to achieve a pregnancy, but then to lose the pregnancy. And again, there are many reasons why a woman may miscarry, but we do know that one cause could be low progesterone. So if we can be proactive and understand the charting pattern that shows us that miscarriage is a risk in just regards to what their hormones are doing. We want to be really proactive about that. And in our, in the center that I'm the practitioner in, um, the doctor that, that works with us, anytime a woman achieves pregnancy, we always check her progesterone levels always. Because while I said the progesterone levels, if they're not adequate, she's at risk of miscarriage. Well, when she gets pregnant, the progesterone levels need to be at a certain um, unit as well for a healthy pregnancy onward. So um, anyway, that's often something I see in charting patterns where the woman would not have any clue. She's just charting to avoid pregnancy. And then we see that there's this underlying um, luteal phase defect is what it's called when you have low progesterone, which Hello. also causes, I'm going to say real quick too, also causes mood issues, mood swings, right. PMS, all the things, again, which we're told is part of being a woman, but honestly, it doesn't have to be that way. Often it's a sign, you know, of a hormone imbalance. So I love that women can be proactive about conception. I mean, I don't think we often think about, I mean, we, as women, when we desire motherhood, of course, we, everyone wants a healthy pregnancy and you know, no one wants to miscarry, but how cool is it that if women learn how to chart that they can already take like a proactive step to have a healthy pregnancy? And you're right. I mean, I mean, I'm a nurse practitioner, right? So I see these patients that come and they're referred to me by their charting teacher and what the charting teacher is looking at because they've been trained to see these signs in the cycle that could tell us if there's a hormonal imbalance. 
So Jamie, you mentioned one of them as being luteal phase deficiency. So just for, um, you know, speaking to that abnormality, you mentioned that, you know, that phase of the cycle that is so important to the luteal phase for um, nourishing the lining of the uterus and protecting a new life, that hormone that supports that is progesterone. And if progesterone is deficient, what will happen is, is that cycle will end up being shorter than normal. And particularly the phase of the cycle that we call the post ovulatory phase. So we know in a normal cycle that you have your period, you have your pre ovulatory phase. And then of course, in the middle smack dab is ovulation, the main event. And then after ovulation is the post ovulatory phase. And what's so cool about the post ovulatory phase, and which actually allows women to know exactly the day their period is going to start every month, is that it's always super stable. So for every woman, it's going to be the same. So I have a 12 day post ovulatory phase. I know every month, if I identify ovulation, that my period is going to start 12 days later. And that's super cool. But for a woman who is deficient in progesterone, it could be that her period is starting eight days after her ovulation or even seven days or even five. I've seen it as short as three days. And that is a significant sign that there is something not right with the corpus luteum that produces progesterone, something not right with that ovulation process. And if we can proactively jump in and fix that before someone gets pregnant, I mean, we're saving a life potentially. I mean, it's amazing that we can go to the lengths of being that proactive with women. Absolutely. So do you have any other examples in charting where you know women might, I mean, you mentioned tail and brown bleeding. Um, what other kind of subtle bleeding issues do you notice in charting that you think, oh, you know what, this is something I might want to refer to a healthcare provider? Totally. Um, what I find often is when we're young, we're taught that any bleeding in your cycle is your period. We're just told any blood, period. So it's very common to hear, oh, my period, it just goes on and on and on and on. Or I get my period two times a cycle or two times a month or whatever. And then the only way to know if the woman is actually having her period is like, you know, if there is that crescendo, day crescendo or the day crescendo, like a little ski hill. You know, you're up, you're down, or you're just up and then you go down if that makes sense. So you start off as like moderate heavy to then light, very light, or you start off a little, like a couple days or less of light, very light before you get to moderate heavy. And that's normal. But for women who think they're having their, their period every day or twice a month, um, the question is, what kind of bleeding are you noticing? So that's something I see a lot as I'm working with women is they might come and say, I'm getting my period every single day. And I think, well, no, you don't haven't gotten your period probably for months and months, actually, you're just noticing spotting, you know, which, you know, there's a number of things. And um, that's going to be a question I ask you, Teresa, to answer, you know, what are some of those common um, diagnoses that do come with that description? Right. You know, there's not a heavy flow, there's not moderate flow, it's just spotting. So that's something I see a lot in women is there's just bleeding that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't go higher or lower. Or the ma the amount doesn't change. It's just a little bit of bleeding. Right. So in um, the medical world, we call that abnormal uterine bleeding or unusual bleeding. And yeah, I mean, it it is very common for a patient to come in and think that their period is happening a couple of times a month when actually what's happening is, is they're having their period and then they're having an abnormal bleeding event. And it's important, of course, to get to the bottom of abnormal bleeding events because they can be as simple as a hormonal deficiency to as you know complex as even a precancerous or cancerous condition. So we want to make sure that women are aware of what's normal in a period and what's unusual bleeding. And um, many times, even with polycystic ovarian syndrome, very common condition, women will go a long period of time with not having a period, a normal period. And so they will end up having abnormal bleeding events because what, again, and if you look at it from an underlying root causes, anybody who has irregular periods is having what? Irregular ovulation because it's ovulation that causes a normal healthy period. 
And so we have to remember if your periods are irregular, that means that your ovulation is irregular. And we have to figure out what is causing it. It could be a thyroid issue or another hormone off balance. So unusual bleeding, that's a great one. Um, the other one I think that would be interesting to talk about would be, you know, the one kind of biological marker that a lot of times women don't even focus on when they're not charting, and that's cervical mucus. So this is so important because I work with patients that have fertility issues, and a lot of times they've been trying to get pregnant for years, and all of a sudden you, you have them start charting their cycles, and they realize they don't make enough cervical mucus, and they would have never known that before. And as we've talked about the importance of cervical mucus, and it, it, basically it's so important if you don't have it, there's no baby. There's no chance ever of having a baby without cervical mucus because sperm have to have that mucus in order to get to the egg. And so if you're infertile and you don't have cerv cervical mucus, like that's one of the main issues going on. And that can be related to hormone issues and physical issues too. But have, I mean, I have seen that in practice um, I, I don't know if you've had an experience of really just that mucus pattern really not being seen until women learn how to chart. Yeah. Uh, one in particular, um, there's a couple who were working to achieve pregnancy. They weren't getting pregnant. Um, they had just gone to their ob gyn and they referred them to the closest IVF facility, you know, to whatever. And they were going to have to take out their savings and do all this you know, preparation financially um, in order to do what needed to be done. They couldn't get pregnant. It had been three years. The doctor had checked to see if she was ovulating. She was. They checked to see if her hormone levels were normal. They were. And they're like, you're, a, it's a quandary. The husband had sperm count that was normal. I don't know what to do. This is our only option. IVF. Praise the Lord, literally. She went to church one day. Someone gave her my name. And so her and her husband came to me they're like we're gonna try this we're just gonna try it just to see before we you know go down to the, the IVF route so of course she starts to chart I'm like you have hardly any cervical mucus she had one day of mucus very scanty hardly any mucus at all so then the next cycle I suggested that she take a supplement that helps to increase your cervical mucus that next cycle she took it she became pregnant, and now that little girl is six. Wow. <laughs> it was crazy. What, caught, what would have cost her thousands of dollars cost her six dollars at wow. the store. <laughs> it's that crazy. Awesome. It was just just beautiful thing. And, and what makes me the most frustrated, but what also opens my eyes, um, is that her, her doctor just didn't realize the importance of of the cervical mucus, you know, and sometimes, you know, I think maybe people think that, you know, I'm trying to keep this information close to my chest. Well, I don't know if they think that, but I can imagine someone thinking, oh, if you, if you're, if you're teaching something, you don't want other people to know, but uh, on the contrary, like I want all doctors to know, I would go and speak. And I know you do. And I do like all medical professionals, this is an invitation to please serve your patients and please learn about the importance of this. And, and some do and some don't. And so that can be our role. Yeah. Oftentimes, I mean, we say that couples or a woman that learns how to chart is she probably knows more about the science of the female body than her doctors do, which is so unfortunate because it's not rocket science. It's just that it's something that isn't taught in medical school. And, um, you know, we have through the um, Dr. Marguerite Duane, a, a family practice doctor that teaches mm -hmm. um, fertility awareness based methods. And she always talks about how she didn't learn about anything in medical school about the cycle and cervical mucus. So we know that these doctors aren't getting trained. So it's not their fault, but we do have an obligation to share the information then with them because for many doctors, that experience actually is very eye-opening and they will utilize that information. So that's great. Okay, so we've talked about mucus in terms of like fertility, but I want to also address mucus patterns in terms of just what's normal and not normal because we know that um, infections, um, cervical infections or vaginal infections are a common issue for women. And, you know, there's a normal mucus that of course happens every month. A lot of women may have thought it was an infection, even though it's normal. So that's one thing that can happen. So just understanding that the normal mucus pattern for women is a healthy thing and that, 
and the vaginal environment is um, meant to kind of be um, a, a perfectly kind of self-cleansing organ that has a microbiome basically that, that keeps itself healthy. But there are times when infections do occur and we can see patterns of discharge in those infections. And one of the things that I love to do is when I'm looking at a chart is to look at the mucus pattern. And sometimes women have symptoms of infection, but sometimes women don't. And you can actually just see it in the mucus pattern. For example, um, I often see that women who have a bacterial infection will have a watery discharge. And so this watery discharge is a dampness or a wetness that they have kind of as a continual daily basis. And when I ask them about that, then they're like, yeah, you know, I do have that symptom of wetness every day. And if I culture that, oftentimes I find that's a bacterial infection. Another thing that we can see in mucus is sometimes the color will turn yellow or green even. And when women are watching those mucus patterns closely, they're self-identifying this mucus color. And they can be like, hey, I've noticed this is really yellow. Um, and I've noticed this seems almost like a greenish tint. And when we culture those, um, we have found that many times those are coming back with, again, an abnormal bacteria. So I love that women can actually kind of be proactive about even seeing those abnormal mucus patterns that lead to their basically infection. So that's another uh, normal abnormal. Do you have any other... I mean, I, I guess one thing before we kind of finish up here today is just pain, I think, with the cycle. I mm -hmm. think many times, and I just saw a patient recently, uh, this week actually, and um, she was talking about her cycle and she was trying to be proactive about um, getting married and, and potentially having a baby. But she said, you know, my periods have been horrible my whole life. And she's like, I think they're kind of probably what other women experience, but I don't know. And she, her pain level was just out of control. She would sometimes have to stay home from work, from school. And she really just chalked it up to this is what women go through. And women need to know that, yes, there are menstrual cramps. And, and menstrual cramps, you know, generally um, are uncomfortable, but they're, they sh you should not be in pain. You should not be in a level of pain that makes you want to crawl in bed for the whole day with a water bottle and a heating pad. Um, so pain is not normal. And that's another thing sometimes just in charting, I feel like, because you're talking to somebody about it and they're like, mm, I just don't think this is normal. And that should be investigated. Totally. What would you say is, um, some recommendations that a medical professional or a nap pro doctor or trained fertility awareness, uh, medical professional, what recommendation would they make for women who experience? Yeah. Painful periods? Well, oftentimes for me, I mean, I definitely assess the level of pain and there's certain levels of pain that you just have to investigate like with an ultrasound you have to consider the diagnosis of endometriosis which definitely causes pain in the cycle but let's say let's say it, it's just more a mild to moderate discomfort then i am going to use things like have they tried ibuprofen can they take ibuprofen safely and are they taking a therapeutic dose because many women don't realize that what causes the uterine lining to shed is an inflammatory process. Our bodies make these chemicals called prostaglandins. And prostaglandins basically cause the, the breakdown, you could say, or shedding of that lining of the uterus. And those prostaglandins lead to the cramps. Um, and it's an inflammatory process. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications that are over the counter, like ibuprofen, can be utilized safely and they really do work for most women. It's just that most women are not taught how to take them correctly. They need to be taken before the cramps get bad. And they need to be taken usually at a higher dose, like three tablets or 600 milligrams, and sometimes even four tablets or 800 milligrams. And many times for me, that's kind of an assessment of who needs further investigation versus just good management of their cycles. Mm -hmm. um, I find that supplements really help with cramps of the period, like fish oil, magnesium, even just um, if a patient has low iron. Um, so sometimes putting girls on prenatal vitamins, even if they're not trying to get pregnant, mm -hmm. prenatal vitamins kind of contain everything that a woman's body needs, including extra iron during their period. And that I've seen one time I had a patient 
And I, I thought maybe she could have endometriosis and I put her on all these vitamins and she came back in two months in tears, crying. And I was like, oh no, it didn't work. I'm so sorry, you know? And she's like, no. She said, I have no pain with my period anymore. And she was shocked. And I was kind of shocked too, because her pain seemed so bad. And she's like, I don't understand it. And I'm crying because I just don't understand how vitamins could fix it. Yeah. And I mean, that sometimes happens where if you just kind of support the woman's body with nutrition and nutrients that she mm -hmm. needs, sometimes you're again, calming that inflammation down. So that's super cool. And those are some of the things I do. Totally. Awesome. And then the anti-inflammatory diet, like red meats and sugars and those sorts of things cause inflammation in the body anyway. So sometimes what I've learned to say is just, you know, approaching your period or during your period try to limit your the red meats the sugars the carbs and that kind of thing um and then also like turmeric is something that i'm hearing more and more and i love personally um for just naturally decreasing the inflammation in the body as well so yeah it's so wonderful that there are so many things that we just often are not even shared and it makes sense because most women who experience painful periods are often put on the pill Therefore, their period, the pain goes away and they think they're fixed, which in reality, mm -hmm. we know they're not. And that's a whole other episode. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, there is hope for women, isn't there, Teresa? Like we see it all the time and we, we see that there's hope and there is hope. And so hopefully just by understanding what a healthy cycle looks like, and then also hopefully, again, with this information, you have tools and an understanding um, more than you had before you started listening to this about what may be going on in your own cycle. 